Thank you. Morning, everybody. I'm so glad you're joining us. Uh, this is our, our seventh climate change speaker series presentation. So we're glad you could join us. I am one of the co-chairs of the Climate Change Committee. And I uh, just want you to know, let's see, in the chat, you will find a link where you can contact Linda Sula, uh, the other co-chair, or me, uh, if you have any questions or want to join the committee. So those will be in the chat. Last meeting in June, we had presentations about the drought and wildfires. A lot has happened in this past month in regards to both of those. So following this presentation, we will give you an update on what's going on in those areas. And I also just want to let you know that Linda and I have made the decision for the rest of this year, anyway, all of the coming climate change speaker series and meetings will continue to be 100% on Zoom. So I just wanted to let you know that. And at this point, I'm going to pass this over to Linda, who is going to introduce today's speaker. Hi, guys. I'm Linda Sula. Um, it's just so hard to believe that the summer is passing by so quickly. And um, climate change continues to rear its ugly head, unfortunately. Luckily, the federal, state, and local governments are doing what they can and a lot to combat it. But let's all do our part. So our program today is Climate Action Planning in Marin. We're lucky enough to have Christine O'Rourke with us today. Christine is a planning consultant based in Novato and is the sustainability coordinator for the Marin Climate and Energy Partnership. This is the countrywide partnership of the Marin jurisdictions and public agencies. Christine specializes in development of climate action plans and greenhouse gas inventories. She has prepared plans for cities and towns throughout the Bay Area, including all Marin jurisdictions. Christine earned her Bachelor of Science degree from Boston University and her MBA from San Francisco State. She is here today to explain climate action plans in Marin. So Christine, thanks again for coming and it's all yours. Great, thank you so much for having me and good morning, everyone. It really is a pleasure to be here with you. I have a presentation, so let me share my screen. All right, can everybody see that? Yeah, great. So um, yes, as Linda said, I'm the sustainability coordinator for the Marine Climate and Energy Partnership. We've been around since 2007 and, um, and we've been working together to kind of implement our climate action plans to first develop them and then to implement them. And we do the greenhouse gas inventories uh, as well. We've been doing them since 2005. So we have data going back now for 14 years. The last um, inventories were, I'm still kind of finalizing them, but therefore calendar year 2019. And I know we're in 2021, um, but it takes a while to get all the data from all the different agencies. You know, in particular, emission factors take a long time to kind of compile and, and to verify. So 2019 is just the latest year that we have all the data we need to do these community-wide inventories. We also do uh, government operations inventories and for the local governments, those are a little bit more time consuming uh, because we have to collect a lot of data from all the individual jurisdictions. So we do those every five years. Um, we've done three of them so far. And as I said, we are also developing climate action plans. We started off doing them back in 20, I think 2011, 2010 and 2011 were the first climate action plans that were developed here locally in Marin. And we were pretty early um, for California as well. And at this point, all of our local jurisdictions have climate action plans and we've actually begun updating those. So the last, in the last past couple of years, San Rafael's updated there, San Anselmo. Um, I worked on the, the counties. Uh, Fairfax just adopted a climate action plan. Larkspur is about to adopt their updated plan. So we're kind of in our second phase of CAPS. Uh, the climate action plans have strategies and actions to reduce emissions, both from community emissions and government operations. 
but usually government operations only contribute about 1% of the community's emissions. So, you know, everybody's always looking at government to, you know, to green their operations, but it's, it doesn't contribute that much um, to the overall picture. So it's really important that we educate and motivate our community members to reduce their emissions. The climate action plans are used to guide um, adoption of future ordinances um, to implement programs and also to invest in capital improvements. And that could be anything from switching out streetlights to LED lights, to doing um, energy efficiency projects or building resilient, new resilient buildings, et cetera. So um, just to give you a little bit background first on what the state has been doing around greenhouse gas reduction and specifically legislation that the state has passed to, um, along these lines. So the first one was Assembly Bill 32 and that was passed back in 2006. So this really was groundbreaking for the, you know, on a, on, for the entire United States at that time. And that was to limit emissions and reduce emissions to 1990 levels by the year 2020. Uh, we at the, at the jurisdiction level don't really know what our levels were in 1990. We just don't have that data. So what we do is we, um, we estimate them. So we estimate 1990 levels as being 15% below what they were in 2005, but essentially we're all using kind of the same target. And um, so the, the state and as well as the cities all actually met this target early before 2020, kind of met it in like, like 2016. Um, and in that year, the state adopted a new, um, a new bill, Senate Bill 32, and that set the next target, and that was to reduce emissions 40% below 1990 levels by the year 2030. So this is kind of the, lim the minimum that all of our new rounds of climate action plans are targeting. Uh, our first rounds were targeting that AB 32 um, to, you know, for 2020 target. Now we're looking at 2030. There are some additional executive orders that have been passed over the years. Um, one, not too long ago, is to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045. And carbon neutrality just means um, that it's a combination of reducing emissions as well as sequestering or storing carbon in our environment. And that's usually like in the natural environment. A lot of that can be stored in kind of agricultural and working lands. Um, overall, what we're looking to do is, um, or at least the executive orders um, are, uh, are geared to reducing emissions 80% below 1990 levels by the year 2050. So that's kind of our long-term target. That is, um, would result, uh, according to scientific knowledge, um, of limiting warming to two degrees centigrade. Of course, at this point, you know, there's been a lot of studies um, that says that even two degrees is too little, too late, that we need to be um, moving that up and trying to limit warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade because at yeah, two degrees, the, the impacts are just gonna be too catastrophic. But um, that said, this is kind of you know, what, we're, what we're dealing with, at least at the state level with the legislation and executive orders. So as I mentioned earlier, we do climate, um, we do greenhouse gas inventories and we do them for the individual jurisdictions. And then I also do one for the entire county. So this is a look at emissions for the county in 2019. This is preliminary. I'm still kind of finalizing this. So you're getting the first look at it. Um, and when we talk about our greenhouse gas emissions inventories, we are only counting a subset of all of the emissions. We're, what we're doing is uh, a, what we call an activity-based inventory. So we're looking at emissions that are essentially created by activities that occur within the um, jurisdictional boundaries or within the county boundaries. So we're not looking at things like upstream emissions from production, um, shipping, mining, um, a growing of food, anything that occurs outside of the boundaries. If the growing of food occurs inside the boundaries, then we are counting it. But if you're purchasing something that's made in China, we're not counting those, those emissions unless we are talking about like the, tr the truck that is picking it up from the port and then delivering it to the store or delivering it to your, to your door. Um, and 
So those kind of emissions we're counting. So these activity-based emissions really only count about 20% of the entire carbon footprint of a household. Uh, we don't do the other one, all of the consumption-based emissions inventories because they're really hard to track. They're hard to quantify. The Air District did do a consumption-based inventory. Um, that was a few years ago and it was using 2013 data. So that's the latest data that we have. So as you can see, it's uh, for us, what we want to do is track um, every year and see how we're progressing. And we want to track things that we know we can pretty reliably um, quantify. And there are very, um, there's a lot of protocols around doing these greenhouse gas emissions inventories that we rely on. So the largest sector of emissions here in Marin County comes from the transportation sector. That's more than half of emissions. And about 85% of those emissions are from passenger vehicles. The rest are commercial vehicles. A small amount is coming from um, transit, from public, um, from buses, from the smart train. Uh, et cetera. The next largest slice of this pie here is what we call the built environment, and that's natural gas use in residences and commercial buildings, and that's 27% of all emissions. If you look up um, at the top, the built environment electricity slice is 7%. That used to be a much larger slice of this pie, but our electricity has been getting so much cleaner. We've also been reducing our electricity consumption a bit, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but the electricity has gotten so much cleaner, so it represents a much smaller piece of this pie at this point. Uh, you can also see that you know, because our electricity is so clean, we're not gonna get a lot of more emissions reductions from that slice of this pie. Agriculture comes in at 10%. Um, the emissions from agriculture co come from enteric fermentation, from, uh, from certain animals, also from uh, manure uh, and methane that's produced from the manure, as well as emissions that come from fertilizer application. The waste sector is actually kind of surprisingly low. It's only 4% of emissions. So this is emissions that come from the decomposition of waste in our landfills and specifically organic waste because the other waste doesn't, um, doesn't decompose and pr and to produce methane. And so, but this is also, you know, food waste that's in our, our waste stream, paper, um, green waste that, that doesn't become composted ends up, that ends up in the landfill that's all creating emissions. And then we have these very small sectors. The off-road is emissions that come from construction and landscape vehicles and equipment. So this is anything that's used off-road. These are, you know, a lot of these are diesel, um, but a lot of landscape equipment uses gasoline. And then water and wastewater are the smallest sector. That's at 1%. So this is energy that's used to um, kind of uh, get, procure the water, to kind of pump the water, to treat it, to transport it from the water source to the water users. Also emissions in the energy that's used to treat wastewater. And then the wastewater also, as it breaks down, it produces um, process emissions like methane and nitrous, ox um, and nitrous oxide. And so those are the emissions that are counted there. So all totaled, we're um, at about 1.4 million metric tons, carbon dioxide equivalents. So this is a look at our emissions, um, the trend and where we're, and also kind of what, where we're headed and what we are hoping to achieve through our climate action plans. This light blue line here is, I don't know if you can see, can you see my, my um, pointer? I don't think you can. Yes, you can see it. You can see it. Okay, great. So this is showing the actual emissions starting in 2005, emissions actually went up around 2008 and peaked and they've been coming down steadily. So at this point, we are at about 25% below where we started in 2005, which is actually pretty good progress. We hit, as I said, that, um, that emissions reduction early back in 2016, we, we hit our 2020 target. So now what we're looking at is this next thing is the business as usual forecast. So where we are now, what we assume emissions will continue as if we just kind of stop doing what we're doing, we just continue it on the path that we are going on. We're looking at population growth and employment growth, changes in vehicle miles traveled, which is transportation. Um, in that case, 
emissions would actually kind of peak and then according to this forecast would start to decline because and this is because the department of finance was actually forecasting lower um, population growth at the time when this was made so this is our um, our goal here is first of all this one the purple line is to reduce emissions to 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2050 so that's what that would um, need to accomplish through what we call mitigation. That's just the straight out reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from their source. And then this green line is that additional amount um, that we're hoping to sequester through uh, uh, storage of carbon and carbon dioxide in the environment. At this point, all of our climate action plans really are geared towards 2030. They'll have actions to reduce emissions and then on the county for the county to additionally to sequester emissions um, to 2030. We do talk about these longer term goals and what's going to be needed, but we just we're we're kind of using evidence based um, strategies. And we're also relying on you know, state laws that have been passed and actions that are currently, you know, kind of either being taken or being are planned. And so we don't really have a very clear picture of what those actions would be post 2030. So we're essentially gearing to 2030 at this point. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about each one of these sectors and how we're kind of, you know, what the trends are and how we're addressing them in our climate action plans. So for low carbon transportation, um, a lot of the work around this and where we see that we're going to be able to kind of really take a big chunk of those emissions out, that more than half of our emissions is through zero emission vehicles or electric vehicles. Zero emission vehicles include um, battery vehicles. So the 100% EVs like a Tesla or a Chevy Bolt. Uh, they also include plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So those are vehicles that might use, um, you know, have like 20 or 30 gallons that they uh, uh, of gasoline. And then they also have, uh, and then they have the uh, uh, ability to run on electric as well, but you plug those in. And then fuel cell vehicles, which actually make up a very small population of the zero emission vehicles here in Marin County. So the state goals are to have, um, the latest state goals were to have 5 million EVs by 2030, which would be about 13% of all registered vehicles in California. And then you may have heard there a few months ago, um, Governor Newsom passed an, uh, issued an executive order that would require all new passenger vehicles sold in California to be zero emission by 2035, and then to have medium and heavy duty trucks by 2045. So that, um, that will actually really help to spur uh, the market. And we do see, you know, every, every year, every almost, you know, almost every month, uh, new manu manufacturers are, um, issue, you know, talking about new models that they have. Ford just most recently talked about the new Ford uh, F-150, which is the most popular vehicle in all of the um, United States. They're going, coming out with an electric version as well. So with, with the, you know, better range, um, uh, more charging stations and more uh, versatility in the types of models that are out there, we really are seeing and hoping for a big increase in electric vehicles. So Marin County has the second highest electric vehicle rate in the state. We're second only to Santa Clara County. So that's really good. Right now, about 4% of all the automobiles registered in Marin County are electric vehicles. We have over 9,700 zero emission vehicles on the road. We also have over 700 public EV chargers that are installed. This picture here is um, at the county, at the Civic Center. And so there are, there are EV chargers on public land, but also you know, that you'll find them at shopping centers, at workplaces, and more are getting installed all the time. So we really see that electric vehicles are a big opportunity to reduce our transportation emissions. Our local goals and our climate action plans are to have 25 to 45% of passenger vehicles that are registered in Marin to be in zero emission by 2030. And this really is, it's kind of critical. If we don't reach that kind of um, electric vehicle penetration in Marin, we're not going to be able to reach our 2030 goals. 
Um, and before I move on to this next slide, I do want to talk about also that although EVs are really important, are the probably the biggest way that we're going to reduce transportation emissions, we also have um, a lot of programs about improving our pedestrian and bicycle networks. We need to get people out of, out of their vehicles and biking and walking, especially for those short distances as well. So I don't wanna give short shrift to those programs. They are also really um, very important and are uh, in our climate action plans as well. So then moving on to renewable energy and electrification. As I mentioned earlier, electricity is really clean in Marin and it's, and it's getting cleaner. So we were the, um, the first um, county in the state to de develop what's called a community choice aggregation program. That's the Marine Clean Energy Program. And so that was really instrumental in kind of spurring this um, market to have more renewable energy and more renewables in our electricity and, and uh, green electricity come from greenhouse gas resources. MCE's goal is to be virtually 100% greenhouse gas free by 2022. Uh, PG&E has also made really great strides in, uh, in increasing their renewable content and their electricity as well. So our climate action plans are actually assuming that electricity is going to be even smaller than that 8% of that pie that I was talking about earlier um, by, by 2030. State law is also requiring that 60% of electricity come from renewable sources by 2030 and to be GHG free by 2045. We also see that solar installation continues to grow in Marin County. It's growing at about 15% annually countywide. There are new state laws in the building code. It requires all new homes to install solar. Uh, at this point, the, the electrical grid here in California um, at times we'll have excess solar on the grid and we're, we just sell it and sometimes give it to, to our neighboring states because we have too much solar. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to hear, to, to continue to grow our renewable content in our electricity. Um, of course, you know, we do have the issue about um, how are we, we need to be able to store all of that renewable electricity so that we can use it at, at times when the sun isn't shining, shining the wind's not blowing. Um, there's a lot of new things that are coming. Um, of course, battery storage, and as batteries become less expensive, that will become even more viable, both at the electrical grid scale, as well as for homeowners. Um, you know, having a, a Tesla power wall for example, teamed up with your solar panels can give you, can make your home more resilient so that you'll be able to kind of weather any power, public safety power shutoffs that we may have. Um, there's also other technologies too. Uh, they're looking at, and at, even MMWD was, is looking at this idea of using excess solar during the day to pump water up the hill and then to release that water at, in the evening when we need electricity and to create elect, um, hydroelectricity um, in the evening. So um, a lot of really exciting work being done on this front. So here, what we see is that a really big opportunity in our climate action plans is to kind of use this very clean electricity that we have now and that's going to get cleaner and to convert all of our appliances and our heating systems that use natural gas now to ones that use renewable and greenhouse gas free electricity. Um, the county has a reach code that incentivizes all electric buildings. And the county also is running right now a program called Electrify Marin. And that provides rebates for fuel switching appliances and heating systems. Um, I'm assuming, you know, it's kind of a pilot program. They just funded it. The county um, board of supervisors funded it for another year. I think we'll be seeing more rebates available um, from at the state level for fuel switching appliances and heating systems. So, and the county, the state also is looking at, and they've committed to having all electric building requirements by, um, you know, for both residential and, and, uh, and non-residential buildings. And so with the building codes, we get new building codes every three years and the state always ratchets up the energy requirement. And as I said earlier, you know, they, they also are requiring a solar installation now with new buildings. And what we're looking at is that the state will probably be requiring or where they will be at some point in the future, all new construction to be all electric. 
So one of the things that we're looking at in our climate action plans is to have ordinances at the local level that will prohibit um, natural gas in new construction, both starting off with residential buildings and, with, and then moving on to non-residential commercial buildings. And we're looking at doing that with the new buildings um, cycle. So if the state doesn't do it, the county is going to kind of, the, all of the jurisdictions in the county are looking to step up and adopt what we call these REACH code, codes that will will force that. The other ordinance that we're looking at and we're um, beginning, we're putting into our climate action plans is to look at an, uh, adopting an ordinance that would require all appliances and heating systems to be high efficient electric at the time of replacement. So if your water heater goes out and you go to get a permit, the requirement would be that you put in um, a high efficient electric water heater. There would of course have to be some exemptions, um, heating systems, there are, you know, there, there could, and it, we're assuming, we're looking at this doing something like this probably in 2024. Presumably by then, some of these are, you know, like induction stoves, um, heat pump technology for water heaters, for heating systems, they can all be expensive. We're hoping by that time that the prices come down and it's just more economically feasible. But there could be exemptions for if, if it really is a cost burden for a household. There could there also may need to be exceptions for, um, for example, like a hot, a high efficiency hot water uh, heater has to be cannot be inside the um, the building if uh, the condition space of the building it needs to be like in an attic or a garage. And if that's not available, then it's not it's just not technologically feasible. So there would be some sort of exemptions. But essentially, when we look at the rate of replacement of these appliances, um, you know, just kind of the life cycle of appliances, if we start if we start replacing these with electric versions, we really can start taking a a good chunk, um, reducing a good chunk of those natural gas emissions. Uh, the problem here in Marin County is that we're essentially built out. We just aren't adding that many new houses. I, we do, we probably do more teardowns and replacements. And of course that's considered new construction and that would be subject to new regulations. But if we're really gonna make a big dent in our natural gas emissions, we, we need to get at all of the existing housing stock. So this is, this is one way to do that. I'd love to be able to uh, ask a question if it's if it's okay. Uh, I think we were going to hold all of the questions to the end of the presentation. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, so then with energy efficiency, we see that energy consumption, both in natural gas and electricity use, have been declining about 1% each year. A lot of that natural gas use is used to heat our buildings. Um, so kind of I guess, I guess you could call it a silver lining um, as, the, as the world continues to warm, warm, at least here, we're not gonna be using as much natural gas. We'll probably be relying more on electricity for our, um, for our air conditioning units. Um, as I said, this building codes ratchet up those energy efficiency requirements in the, and we do have uh, um, both the county and as well as local governments have um, energy efficiency requirements that are above the state building code. So, you know, we still see that there's opportunities to improve energy efficiency in our, in our buildings. Um, we are supporting um, in our climate action plans, local and utility energy efficiency programs. There's a lot of rebates out there. There are audits, there's technical assistance, there's um, special financing programs. And so uh, we're re kind of relying on those, promoting those and educating the, the public about those different programs so that they continue to improve energy efficiency in homes and in commercial buildings. Um, moving on to waste reduction. So our total landfill waste is down 6% since 2005. Our emissions are actually doing better than that. And that's because we are actually starting to get the organic waste out of the waste stream, both what we've kind of put in our, our gray cans that goes directly to the landfill, as well as what is used, it's called alternative daily cover. And it's what the landfill uses to cover up the, the landfill at the end of every day. And that's to kind of prevent, to prevent, um, 
rodents and and uh, and to keep the wind from blowing some of the material off of the, the landfill. And so they used to use a lot more green waste than they do now. They're actually beginning to, they're composting more of that green waste. So the emissions are, are um, down more than 6%. There's a lot of state laws. You may have heard about these recently. Um, they're going into, a, a whole slew of them go into effect on January 1st. So the state laws are essentially designed to divert 75% of organic material. That's 75% from 2014 um, levels by 2025. And the laws are also um, around recovering the edible food that gets put into the, into the landfill. And so the law is to, um, with the goal to recover 20% of edible food. So we, um, we have a lot of work uh, at the jurisdiction level and also with our waste haulers to um, kind of put these state laws into, uh, to implement them. There's also laws that require businesses to have organic waste recycling service. They're going to now be, there'll be penalties for them to, if they don't actually utilize those, those services. And then we have, um, can, uh, um, there's a state law and also through the building code that requires 65% of construction and demolition waste to be diverted from the, from the landfill. So our um, climate action plans, and kind of have local programs that support those state laws. We have programs to increase recycling, composting and food recovering. And essentially um, our messaging really is to reduce first. We wanna, you know, the less we just use in the first place, we don't have, we're not creating those upstream emissions through the production and transportation um, of those of products. So reducing is kind of the first, um, first order in first, uh, the first point in here. Uh, next, um, our, another messaging here is just to refuse. So when you go to, to the store, refuse using bags, bring your own bag, refuse using straws, um, you know, all, of, all of that stuff that they give you whenever you order, order a, a meal to, for takeout and um, you know, don't, just don't, don't take those. And then to reuse as much as possible. In the water conservation area, water consumption has been declining. We're actually, gallons per capita per day are down 25% since 2005. So that's really good news. Of course, our climate change is expecting that we're going here at the local level, we're probably gonna have more severe and more frequent droughts. And so it's going to be even more essential to continue to our practices for, um, to reduce water use. The um, energy, the emissions that come from water consumption are almost, almost zero at this point because MMWD is purchasing deep green electricity. So that's the deep green electricity. Um, that's the, the product that's offered from MCE, which is 100% renewable. And then Sonoma County, County Water Agency, which provides a lot of water here. Um, most of the water for Nevada comes from Sonoma County. They also purchase greenhouse gas emissions, uh, greenhouse gas free electricity. So emissions from water consumption are down 97% since 2005. Um, but again, our climate action plan still, even though there's not a lot of emissions coming from the sector, we, we certainly acknowledge um, the need to continue to reduce water consumption. So we're planning on reducing water consumption at another 1% per year going forward. And then in the agriculture and um, carbon sequestration, we are looking at um, a sequestering carbon and trying to get to the carbon neutrality by 2045. Again, what I said, most of this is through the agricultural sector. And these programs are in the county's climate action plan. And it's a more effective management of manure, increasing efficiency on the farms, both through their their vehicles, their water use, their energy use. So um, I see I'm kind of getting long here on time. So let me kind of wrap this up. How you can cut your emissions in almost half. So this is kind of a profile of the average household in Marin County, having two, two cars that are using gasoline to drive around, electricity, um, using natural gas for your home, probably for heating in your hot water heater 
and then the waste that you produce. So you're producing probably a little over 25,000 pounds of um, greenhouse gas emissions every year. So what you can do, you well, if you buy one electric vehicle and then you use deep green or solar, you put solar on your house, or you purchase deep green electricity, you're gonna, you could cut those emissions in half. Um, I also, if you switch from kind of your regular electricity to deep green or you go solar, you can reduce those emissions to zero. Um, we're saying here you could cut your natural gas consumption by 25% through, through conservation, um, electrifying some of your um, appliances, and then just doing a better job um, of recycling your organic waste and, and composting. Make sure you get all of your food waste and your paper waste out of the out of your green can and that could cut your emissions in almost by half. What else can you do? Well, first of all, um, we have a website. It's marineclimate.org. You can go there for a lot of tips about what you can do. They're also um, all listed and highlighted in our climate action plans. Something you can do is sign up for a local nonprofit program called Resilient Neighborhoods. And they use a team-based approach to kind of educate people. You, you join this team and you'll quantify your actual uh, carbon emissions for your household. And then you'll learn all kinds of ways to reduce your emissions programs. And you'll make pledges that you do in your team. And um, it's actually a really fun program. You can advocate at the local, state, and national level for climate action policies and funding. And then at the local level, you know, you go to the go to your council meetings and whenever there's anything related to climate action planning on the agenda and kind of advocate for those actions. A lot of our cities and towns also have sustainability committees or, or they're called sustainability commissions or climate action committee. Um, if you join those, then you can kind of help to put your climate action plan in, um, in, you know, put it into action, actually. So I think that's the end of my presentation. And now I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Urban, I believe you had a question you wanted to ask about building codes. Yeah, actually, I've got a few questions, but um, I'll just start by just introducing myself. So for those of you who don't know, I'm uh, Urban. I'm on the Mill Valley City Council. And um, I'm very happy that Christine is gonna be starting our CAP um, at our next council meeting, actually. So um, we're super excited to get that going and um, get that fired up. So, um, and I'm probably be the council person that will be working together with you. So Christine, you and I will be spending some time together, which I really <laughs> look forward Great. to. I'm also um, the co-chair for the, uh, we have a, a group of council people that meet once a month in Marin County everybody's all the cities are participating in on the co-chair for the climate action group for that so um so anyway so i've got a, just a few couple of quick questions and if it's too complicated christine maybe you and i can just talk offline but um the first one um, has to do with building codes it's just like a source of confusion and i've never been able to get a straight answer on this so in mill valley we adopted cal green tier one which is a reach building code in 2016 i think Mm -hmm. uh, when I was on the planning commission. And I know that the county has, and I know that like Larkspur has, but I've never really been quite 100% clear whether that's countywide. In other words, every single one of the 12 jurisdictions has adopted that or whether it varies city by city. Do you know offhand how that yeah, works? Yeah, it varies city by city. So the county adopted a reach code, but that's just for the unincorporated areas. Okay. That's where they have ju jurisdiction over. Okay, yeah, because it comes up all the time. We're constantly trying to figure out. So this uh, this group of mayors and council people were, I, we keep talking about doing electrification. I keep saying, well, this is a building code issue, right? If you change your building code, in other words, you would just adopt Cal Green Tier 1, you will get electrification in new, um, in new structures. And um, anyway, that's really helpful. If you had a, like a matrix of what those cities were, for that, that would be really helpful just to kind of get us organized. Um, yeah, anyway. I, I'm um, quite sure the county has that matrix. So when the county was developing their REACH code, they did um, kind of led the effort and they invited right. um, planners and building officials from all the jurisdictions to help kind of model, you know, develop the model ordinance. The hope was that all of the cities and towns would adopt the same ordinance. I think only San Anselmo did. Some of the other jurisdictions just adopted um, tier one. 
because the county's reach code goes beyond tier one. Um, And then some of the jurisdictions adopted tier one, but excluded the energy efficiency requirements because the tier one affects um, other things like waste and, um, you know, EVs and uh, just, you know, um, there's other, there's other things except energy efficiency. In, mm. in tier one. Wow. So there, so everybody did a, something a little differently, you know, mm. our, or not everybody, some of them are similar, but um, our hope is, you know, especially next time around that we'll get a consistent reach code for cool. all of the jurisdictions. It makes it a lot easier on the contractors and developers going around if there's consistent um, regulations across the county. Yeah, we're trying to get this group of, you know, which has a representative from every city to be, to create more uniformity between all the cities. And um, I think I agree with you. This is like a very straightforward, easy way to do it. If we all adopt the same building code, then we can achieve that same result. So, um, and I know in Mill Valley, there's never an argument really with uh, new construction to get 100% electrification. That's, I've sat through, you know, 200 different meetings on new construction in Mill Valley. And Every time this has come up, it's never been a problem putting solar on the roof and putting green roofs on and putting 100% electrification into the building. So mm-hmm. um, this seems like you know, low-hanging fruit in terms of being able to implement this you know, countywide. Um, the second question I had is, I'm just a little confused on MC. So right now, like, for example, me personally, in our household, for several years, we've had deep green, right, which is something that you um, you ask for, you know, to have from MCE. And so MCE is now going to be a 100% you know, deep green by next year. What does that mean for individuals? Do we still need to get individuals to adopt um, MC deep green or is that gonna be now the default um, measure for everybody? Right, so there's, um, there's a difference between deep green. Well, uh, let me explain this way. Deep green is 100% renewable. So it comes from 100% renewable sources. Um, there, Greenhouse gas free, so their light green product right now contains, and which will become greenhouse or virtually greenhouse gas free, um, uses non renewable greenhouse gas free sources. So that's essentially for them, large hydroelectric is considered, is not small hydroelectric is considered renewable, large is not. So that's really the difference. Um, PG&E's electricity is greenhouse gas free because they use large hydro. They also have nuclear power that's produced from the Diablo Canyon plant. So, so that, that, that will be the, dis, the distinction. I'm not sure what MCE is, will be planning on doing going forward if they'll you know, continue to have a deep green product or, or not. I assume they will, but I just, I just don't know. Okay, but we will have a 100% clean grid, whether it's renewable or not by next year. Is that essentially the- Well, for, for MCE, yes. Um, MCE produce, uh, supplies about 70% of the electricity for, uh, you know, in Marin County. Um, PG&E is supplying, I think it's about 15%. And then there's also, or maybe not quite, and then there's also something called direct access which is legacy electricity that that was um, that was made available back during deregulation and so those that just comes from other um, other electricity providers right. okay. thank you and the sure. last question um, just <laughs> sorry to dominate this but I'm just curious so we're going to start our cap um, like I said at our next meeting and so this will be something that we'll work in towards you know into you know late winter next year I'm just curious, like how, in your experience, how different are these plans from city to city? I mean, we're all, you know, very close to each other. Um, We're not totally dissimilar. I'm just curious, like how different um, a cap is from Mill Valley than a cap for Larkspur or for uh, San Anselmo. You know, a lot of them are really similar. Um, Back when we did the first ones in 20. 10, 2011, we developed a, um, a template that we used for most of the cities. Some of the sm- some of the larger cities had kind of gone off on their own and gotten a consultant and you know had a, a, had a different cap. Um, this time around, with these updates, we started updating first with um, Sam Rafael went first, and so I worked with them and they had a committee and we really kind of went through a very long um, 
process with a lot of community outreach. And we developed a template that we're now using for the other cities and towns. So all of these new ones are really um, using kind of the same template as, you know, as like, as time goes on, we kind of add to them, we refine them a little bit, but you know, there's a lot of commonality among uh, the, at least the new ones. They'll, they'll look very similar if you look at them. And we're planning on doing the same thing for Mill Valley. It's just much more, first of all, it's much more cost-effective to use a template. Um, and then um, secondly, if we have similar programs then it makes it a little easier to kind of do that, you know, work together to implement the programs because they're common to all the CAPs. Thank you so much. And um, thank you everybody for allowing me to be in your meeting. <laughs> thank you, Urban, because I think your questions um, and, and what Christine's offering to answer them are of importance to everybody to hear. So thank you. Uh, Christine, we have a question here from Al Grummet. He is saying, if a city wants to be at the leading edge of emissions mitigation in the county, what provisions should they consider including in their CAP update? If they want to be at the leading edge for the entire county or for uh These well, questions, I, yeah. I would say, you know, leading edge certainly is um Fairfax because Fairfax just adopted a climate action plan with the goal to be at 100 percent greenhouse gas free by by 2030. Um, you know, setting a goal though, it's more about, you know, what are we actually going to do? Um, and it's hard because how are you going, unless you can't mandate everybody to drive a zero emission vehicle, you're not going to get up to 100% or unless you're going to buy a ZEV for everybody, you know, and we're not going to get to 100% unless that happens. Um, so I think, you know, at least like what's in the purview of the local government, I think those reach code ordinances are really critical, um, especially swapping out um, oh, natural gas appliances, I think are really, I think those are probably the biggest thing, um, you know, for, and, and also reach codes that kind of require more um, electric vehicle charging stations for new development, um, for redevelopment as well. We need to get the, you know, just not only for the visibility, but to reduce range anxiety and, and to kind of message that this is, you know, this is where we're going and, you know, electric vehicles are here and, and they're ubiquitous. Okay. Um, we also have a couple questions from Leslie Alden. Leslie, do you want to ask these yourself or do you want me to close them? Uh, you can parse them however you want. <laughs> I need to read them. Okay. So thank you. Um, so Leslie comments that the statistic that jumped out to me is that the municipal emissions are a mere 1%. How do we address the community to address the other 99%? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And, you know, so some of this, it's like sticking carrots, right? So some of it's going to be done through ordinances that require your building to be all electric. Um, some of it is just by making electric vehicle chargers um, available. So it will kind of encourage people to, to change. Um, a lot of it is through education. And so we're, we partner, for example, with Resilient Neighborhoods. Um, MCEP is actually, we've gotten grants for them and we provide some funding for them educating the community and kind of motivating them to take action is really critical. So it's kind of a, you know, there's no one single silver bullet here. It's gonna be, you know, all of these, all, it's definitely an all of, all of the above approach. And Leslie also is asking, when did Corte Madeira originally develop their cap? I know it wasn't adopted until last year, but I don't remember when you first wrote it. They, they had adopted a, um, a climate action plan. I, God, I think it was like 2016. I forget exactly the year. And then um, last year, we kind of updated it, added some more programs, and then it was adopted. So I think, yeah, it was, it was last year. And, you know, with the with 2030 horizon date as well. Okay. And then a comment from um, Leslie, just to underscore the answer about MCE's 100% renewable energy electricity. The default product is expected to be 100% renewable energy in 2022. Though adoption of Deep Green and Marin is only about 5%, spending time and money to educate the public to opt into Deep Green is probably not the place to focus on. 
So, okay. so those are all of the questions that I'm seeing here. Um, anybody else? I don't see any hands raised or... Okay. Well, I think then that a um, few comments to everybody. Certainly, thank you, Christine, so much for spending time with us today. I think the climate action plans are, are key. So every town and city in Marin, as well as the county as a whole, is marching in the same direction. And That's I know it's... Hmm? Yeah, and I was just going to say, all of those climate action plans are also available, as well as the greenhouse gas inventories, are linked at our website at marineclimate.org. And that is uh, link is also in the chat for you um, if everybody wants to just check that out. Um, also to know that we will send a follow-up email with Christine's slides and a link to the recording of today's presentation. So you'll be getting that in the next, um, by the end of the week or certainly early next week. I would also be remiss to not say thank you to our Z team. I forgot to introduce them earlier. We have Didi Butori and Lynn Dooley who are working hard in the background to keep everything going smoothly technologically. So Didi and Lynn, thank you so much for your support. And again, Christine, thank you um, again for joining us today. For those of you who might be leaving uh, and not sticking around for the meeting portion of today's uh, presentations. I just want to let everybody, remind everybody, we do not have a meeting next month. We will be off for the month of August. Our September speakers will be addressing sea level rise and flooding issues and how Marin is addressing them. So as soon as we have those speakers confirmed, we will have that information on our website and be sending out a detailed email so that you can register for that. Um, there will also be a detailed article in the September-October voter, which will come out early September. I think that, Linda, do we have anything else before we move on to our meeting portion? And thank you, everybody, for joining us and hope you stick around. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thanks.